Captain Tyler Stark and I'll be sharing with you what happened to me on April 20th, 1999 at Columbine High School. Now, if you're a little bit uh, older, you probably are familiar with the event uh, and the tragedy that took place on that day. If you're a little bit younger, you may be less familiar. On April 20th, two students went in to Columbine High School, shot and killed 12 students, a teacher, and ultimately themselves. So why Columbine? What led up to this? Columbine's in Littleton, Colorado. It's white suburbia. There's no gangs, there's no real gun violence, knife violence, anything like that that uh, the teachers or the community was concerned about. Just like any high school, we've all been, uh, been there. There's cliques, right? There's little groups. Some of them are, you know, the jocks, the stoners, the cool kids, the nerdy kids, uh, whatever. We're familiar with that. It, it's part of going through high school. At Columbine, there was also a trench coat mafia. Now, out of the 2,000 kids uh, at Columbine, probably only 10 or 15 were in the trench coat mafia. Judging by their name, they wore trench coats all the time and thus stood out and looked different. And because of it, they got picked on. Uh, and eventually, they had enough and they were going to uh, invoke their revenge. They're primarily targeting uh, jocks, so people back then wore the white college hats, and that was their uh, target for April 20th. Now, I was a jock. I played football as a, as a freshman, but in junior high, I was the dork. I had, I was in a band, I had glasses, braces, zits all over, so I knew what it was like to get picked on. So I consciously chose to, although I played sports, not be that sort of uh, bully to, to other people. So leading up to uh, April 20th, what was it like? H happened on a, on a Tuesday. The Monday prior was completely normal, normal day of school. The morning of April 20th was completely normal. I went down to the cafeteria, which you can see sits under the, the library, uh, and there was approximately 400 kids there. Their initial plan was to set propane bombs uh, on the, or near the pillars of the cafeteria with the intent to uh, drop the library onto the cafeteria, killing all 400 students, including myself. As I was sitting there, uh, unknown to me of this, uh, this plan, sitting with my friend uh, Nate and Michael. Now, Nate was a little bit more one of the cool kids and a little bit of a bully, but I'd known him for forever. And he starts picking on Michael. I don't say anything, I don't intervene. And Michael eventually quickly eats his lunch and leaves. I don't think anything of it. Maybe I should have stepped in, maybe not. At 11.17, when the bombs don't go off, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold decide to go to plan B, which is to go in and shoot up the school and have invoke as many casualties as possible. The first sign of this was uh, Mr. Sanders entering the, the side entrance to the cafeteria. His initial words were, everyone get down. So I get down, I happen to be sitting next to the, uh, the far window that you can see uh, in the picture, and we didn't know what was going on. Maybe it's a fire drill, maybe it's some sort of practice procedure, who knows. So I get down and start working my way to the uh, window, which is a few feet away. At that point, I see uh, Dylan Klebold walking down the cement steps you can see just outside the cafeteria. And he had something in his, uh, in his hand. It looked like a, an old sand weight, um, couldn't really tell. But he lights it and throws it in the parking lot. At that point, there's a puff of smoke, and I'm thinking, well, if that was a bomb, there should be damage to the cars around it. But I don't see any broken glass, any damage. I'm thinking, it's a smoke bomb. What's, what's the big deal? At that point, I see Michael, the student, fellow student that was sitting right next to me, up on the hill. And it looks like he's fallen because his pants are shredded and there's a little bit of blood. What I don't know at the time is that he's been shot in the leg and he's trying to get away from uh, Dylan Klebold who had just shot him before he started coming down the steps. Still not processing what's really going on and the implication uh, and seriousness of the situation. At that point I get down and Mr. Sanders says, uh, you know, everyone get out of here. Imagine 400 kids with tables and chairs scattered all about, entering into sheer panic. It was just mass chaos as we start running uh, out, out of the cafeteria towards the, towards the stairs. Now Columbine is built, the bottom floor is pretty much just the cafeteria, the rest of the school uh, is on top. So there's two main hallways, which you can see, and then uh, three connecting hallways. You can see kind of the flow of students as they're uh, running for their lives. So I get halfway towards the stairs in the cafeteria when I start to hear gunfire. Now, I wasn't really brought up around guns, but I figured they'd be a lot louder. It just sounded like fireworks to me, but it was still um, 
I was still very serious and I knew I needed to get out of there. Definitely executed the flight in the uh, flight or fight response. I'm running with my friend Brad as we hit the stairs and start following the crowd of students uh, up to the, the main level, which is where the science rooms were. Now there's teachers out there that know something is going on and they're trying to protect uh, as best they can the students who are now fleeing for their lives. So they start ushering and, and saying, hey, come this way, you know, come hide here, and Brad does so. I still see an empty hallway, which means there's still room for me to run, and that's what I choose to do. So we split off, I continue running down the, the main hallway, and I start to see a backlog of students trying to get out the exit. I do not want to be standing there waiting for my turn to get out when Dylan comes up the stairs and starts shooting down the hallway. So I think I have a good idea. I'm going to go down the middle connecting hallway, go to the other, the main entrance, and go out that way where there's no students. And I'm thinking, it's such a good idea, people are going to follow me, and there's going to be a string of students behind me when I make this turn. So I do so, look behind me, no one, just me, by myself running down this, uh, this middle hallway. When I get to the end, do the quick you know, check of who's around, and I see the other gunman, Eric Harris. Just a black figure, I don't really have time to process that it's him, I just see black trench coat. At that point, he sees me and shoots. The bullet's hit about three feet above my head, and in that moment, there was no thinking involved, it was just pure adrenaline, where I'm, my momentum is going one way, and immediately I'm trying to get traction going the, uh, the opposite direction. The run back down the hallway, turns out it was a bad decision to, to stray from the crowd. There's a few thoughts going through my head. One, since I played football, this is probably the fastest 40 yard dash I've ever done. I wish someone had a, a stopwatch to time me. But more importantly was, what is my fate? What are my options? Option A, he's gonna shoot me from behind and kill me. Option B, He's going to shoot me, I'm going to be paralyzed, he's going to come up and finish the job. Or option three, he's going to shoot me, I'm going to get around the corner, but he's still going to finish the job. Those were the thoughts running through my head as I ran for my life uh, to get away from Eric Harris. Fortunately, none of those things happen. I make it around the corner, I go out the exit I originally intended to with the backlog of students that had now cleared uh, and make it outside of the school. From there, I go across the street to Leewood Park. There's two or three hundred kids uh, in the park trying to figure out what's going on. I ran into a friend, Ian, who was on the football team. And just to give you an idea of the lack of comprehension of what was really going on, our conversation revolved around this is all we're going to be talking about when we go back to class today. No idea that people were getting shot uh, and killed and wounded uh, just did not enter into our minds. As we're, we're standing there, I thought, you know what, I should call my mom, let her know I'm okay. So a friend's house backed up to the park, get on the cordless phone, call my mom, she was a secretary at another elementary school. You know, this is, this is a big, big event, she should answer, right? Nope, I get put on hold. So I'm sitting there on hold in the park and we start to hear gunfire. We see that uh, one of the gunmen, didn't see which one, was shooting across the street into the crowd of students. At this point, I drop the phone and we start hopping fences, me and another uh, friend, to put something in between us and the school. After about three or four yards running through and hopping fences, we figured we're far enough away and get back on the main street. From there, the adrenaline started to, uh, to lower a little bit, and we're both going home to let families know that we were okay. It was about a, a one mile from the school to my house. It was about 25, 30 minutes uh, as all of this from start to me arriving back at home. My brother was at home. He was a senior at the time, and he was on his lunch hour. So he was worried about me because at this point it's hit the news and um, it's a big deal. My dad was also off work at that, uh, at that time, so they're freaked out, they can't get a hold of me. This is before cell phones, pagers might have been around, but wasn't cool enough to have one of those. So they're anxiously waiting the status of, uh, of how I'm doing. I come in, they're super elated to, to see me that I'm okay, uh, and then starts the storytelling. So this is part of the grieving process and processing of what took place. Friends and family were calling to see if that I was okay and of course I had to tell the story very much like I did uh, to you just now. That starts to make it real and give you some perspective on what actually happened to you to start to deal with uh, the tragedy. From there that night, nightmares. For weeks I had nightmares. Imagine that, someone trying, someone chasing and trying to kill me. 
as time went on, they got less intense, less intense, less frequent, uh, and started to, to fade away. But what about the rest of the, the grieving? Although I didn't have any close friends that were killed or wounded, there was lots of community support and memorials for those students that were. And I think this was the, the key area in which we could come as a group of people who had experienced the same thing, share our stories to start to deal with uh, what happened. What I realized is that I made it out pretty good. I was only in the school for a couple minutes. Didn't get wounded, got shot at, but, but that's about it. I thought that was a big deal to me. That's got to be the scariest thing that happened anywhere in the school that day. Turns out, my friend Brad, who went to the science room, he was harassed for over two hours with the shooters shooting through the door, putting pipe bombs at the door to try and blow the door down to get to the students. The whole time they're trying to barricade their, themselves in until SWAT came. So I made it out relatively pretty easy, but it took sharing those stories with people who had been in the same situation to really understand that. Unfortunately, when people who weren't there would try and offer their support, unintentionally they would use words frequently like, I understand or I can relate, and those, those words started to really dig at me. And I couldn't, I couldn't accept it because no, you weren't there. You, you don't know what I'm talking about. And although they were simply intending to give sympathy and compassion, I got angry at them because they can't relate. After uh, about a couple weeks, the community opened up uh, psychologists for everyone to, to go talk to and share their story. And of course, she made, made me see that they weren't trying to make me mad. They weren't really using those literal words. They were just trying to show compassion. And so I took that for, for what it was, and it was kind of a changing point for me in getting over uh, what happened and coming to terms with it. So what do I still hold with me today? One, the sympathy and compassion for those who lost brothers, sisters, fathers, and sons, and the, the trauma that they're still, still dealing with today. The appreciation of life. I was lucky, some others weren't. And you never know when it's your day. Now we're in the military, we put ourselves in harm's way more than our civilian counterpart. But aside from that, you never know when your loved one, it's gonna be the last time you say, I love you or goodbye. Car accidents, freak accidents, especially in the military, uh, you never know when that last moment is. So cherish it and never leave a conversation uh, on a bad note thinking you'll clean it up some other day because there may not be that other day. So what I learned about myself and how I deal with extremely stressful yet unanticipated situations and how to get through those uh, and move on, which would become a factor in 2011 over combat territory in Libya that I entered a spin and had to punch out of my aircraft and evade from enemy forces and ultimately facilitate my own rescue. Both those cases, I feel very fortunate to still be here in order to share my stories with you.